15 or 20 minutes at the end of each talk, the one that we're going to go into now, and the later one for questions and answers and open discussion again. So, store up your questions if you have any. To get something new that we haven't had before, that we haven't experienced before, there are some preliminary states of mind which are quite necessary and quite helpful. One of them being to proceed with what we're going to go into tonight with a state of mind that is both quite light, quite cheerful, quite relaxed, which at the very same time, and not in contradiction to the state of being relaxed, is very earnest and very sincere. And each of you here tonight have made some kind of a sacrifice in one way or another in order to be here. And that is good because it indicates that what you're going to hear tonight or hope to hear is more important to you than perhaps what you would ordinarily be doing. So with a state of mind that is relaxed and receptive and intensely interested, let's go into what is perhaps the most fascinating and perhaps the most misunderstood topic on earth today. When I say the word, I'd like you to do something. You have to work here. I work in New York. When I say the word, you, you remember in our earlier sessions this morning and during the other talks, I said, nothing is more important than to be aware of the state of your mind as it is reacting, as it is responding to everything. Even as you came in here, were you aware of the first move you had as you came through the door, especially if this was your first time here? Maybe a little bit timid, maybe not. But simply to be aware of a state. Because when you are one with a state, this is all there is, and therefore there's no freedom if it's a negative state. The key word, which I'd like you to think about with me tonight, is the word freedom itself. You can hardly pick up your newspaper or see your television show without a reference to freedom, social freedom, political freedom, financial freedom, etc. So what we're going to do during this part of the session is very, very carefully examine what true freedom is and what false freedom is. And by separating the two in our daily work, along the principles of self-observation, self-honesty, we will gradually, and sometimes quite swiftly, if our desire is strong enough, be able to tell the difference between the two. And that is the beginning of being a new man or a new woman. Freedom is, first of all, quite obviously, an internal state. Please forget everything you have ever heard about the word freedom in connection with social freedom, political freedom, or anything like that, because freedom can never be a mass movement. Ten million people may revolt against their government in Africa or South America, somewhere else, and they have a new leader, a new dictator, and the 10 million people are still just as much in slavery as before. They're still at each other's throats, and the allies of one revolution are the enemies of the next. So as a first point, freedom is totally and wholly an internal thing. This gets very personal it means we have to work on ourselves instead of wasting ourselves in political activities, whether we do it even just beside the television set in criticism of this political party or that. 
We can look at ourselves and say, I am not free because right now I am sitting in a negative mood. Freedom is a state of, and this is very important, to connect with your daily life and with the people you meet, and with a whole social structure, to use that fancy phrase. Freedom is a state of authentic conscience. Have you ever, have you ever asked yourself what it means to have a, a true conscience? May I tell you that no human beings on earth have ever even known what it means to have a conscience. Conscience being the same thing as compassion, as love. Mankind as a whole does not live by conscience. He lives by a state of acquired morality. And as long as this morality suits my personal convenience, this is my morality. And I'll preach it, and I'll tell you about it, and I'll wear labels that tell you that I'm a nice person. But I have no hesitation in turning against you if it'll earn me a dollar or if it'll affirm an image I have about myself. So freedom, conscience, authentic love, true compassion are the same thing. So we're going to explore how we become individually free. I assume that most of you live in a family, maybe not all of you. Most of you live in a family of some kind. You're going to have to forget all about everyone else in the family as far as this work is concerned, unless they are as interested in it as you are. Not even bring it up. Do you understand this? Because this is not division within the family. This is for the sake of your growth. And when you and I become human beings of a true conscience, then and then alone do we have something to give to the wife or to the husband or to the child or to the elderly parent. So the most unselfish act you could ever perform on earth is to be a free human being yourself. All else is sham goodness for which we will pay the price. There's a story which I'm going to include my next book, if I may mention it, which will illustrate up to this point what we're talking about. A man woke up one morning in a strange, strange building uh, early in the morning, and when he opened his eyes, he looked around and didn't know where he was. Unfamiliar building to him. So he got up and he was alone in the room, although he saw there other beds and signs of other people there. So he went outside and he saw a vast, vast yard, many other buildings similar to the one he was in, made on the same pattern. And he saw thousands of other men and women, pretty much like him, in fact they were all wearing pretty much the same clothes as they wandered around this area. Uh, performing tests. Some of them were playing games, playing ball, having fun. Others were working on the garden, repairing the house perhaps. But he didn't know where he was. So he asked the first man who came along, what's this place? What are, what are we doing here? He had no idea. The man told him this is a, this is a recreation area, this is a, a rest place, a recreation area where we just uh, do what we feel like doing and have fun and we work around at things and, and have a good time. This is a land of, of liberty, place of liberty. So uh, he, he was still curious about it and wandered around a little more and he noticed very strangely that all around this compound there was a, a very high fence, barbed wire on top, and uh, it was patrolled by guards and watchdogs guards, armed guards, 
watchtowers, the usual watchtowers and gates which were closed all the time. So we got to thinking, well, this is a place of liberty, the man said, and, and everyone else he talked to agreed that this is a very nice place to be. So just out of idle curiosity, he started walking toward one of the gates, which happened to be open at the time, and started to casually walk out. And one of the guards, who was very neatly dressed and very, very polite, extremely polite, called him sir and so on, held him in great verbal respect said, sir, we're not allowed to go out there because, see, this is uh, beyond this gate. It's a very dangerous land. And uh, the reason that we have these guards, he's explaining to him, is because to protect you against what's out there. It's an evil world out there, and we are your friends in protecting you. And uh, confused about it, but he uh, took the man's word for it and wandered around, stayed there for a few days, and it, it didn't please him at all. There was still something wrong, something nagging at him. So he decided to try another gate and just see what happened. So he started to go through that one. And this time, he noticed a very, a very slight change of expression in the guard's face. Uh, while very polite, it was a little bit colder this time, a little bit sharper. And told him that he couldn't go out there because it's a very dangerous place and you're safe in here. And when he persisted, and practically demanded to go out, then, of course, the whole hoax was exposed. And he saw at a glance, real quick, of course, that he was actually a prisoner in there. And that he had been lied to by both the people on the inside and by the very civil and very polite and very, quote, respectful, unquote, guards. This was a, a terrible shock to him. So he went on back in, and most incredible of all to him at this point was the fact that here were all these hundreds and thousands of people who were right around him who didn't have the slightest idea of the true condition of the place. Because everyone he talked to told him this was a very nice place where you did what you want to do. And when he asked them about, how about getting out of here if I want to, if this is a place of freedom, he was told the same thing. You don't understand they're protecting us from the evil world out there <laughs> this this is the man you understand you're catching the point of this i'm sure mm -hmm. finally got tired of living in that mm -hmm. compound and being an unconscious slave and no longer believed the hoax no longer believed the lies and so he did a very intelligent thing which is what we are doing here tonight he began to study the change of guards when they changed the position at the gate he studied the height of the of the fence and he got his equipment together gathered all the knowledge he could and and the story he got out and over the fence and out to authentic freedom where there are no more guards and no one who is telling him falsehoods about his actual state i wonder i wonder if you have ever actually looked out at your friends even, and at humanity as a whole, and realize that this is actually the state that human beings are in. What they call their freedom is imprisonment, and they have the slightest idea of what is going on, because, see, they have never investigated and they have never rebelled against it freedom is also besides at a later date being a state of conscience no man in prison has a conscience or has love he has schemes and he has plans and he has plots and he has falsehood falsehoods you remember something else we brought up i believe it was this morning which connects with all this. To the degree that I am a slave of myself to my negative emotions, I must, I am compelled to try to make you a slave. 
There's no other way. Because I can only be comfortable in my slavery if I have you around as a fellow slave. And then we deceive each other about our, sla about our slavery as these hundreds and thousands of people did in the compound. So when I get tired enough of being in here, inside it, and rise up and study the way out, which starts with knowledge, not with emotion. The way out starts with facts, not with feeling. If you start with feeling, you will go all wrong, because feelings can deceive us, just as people think they're having a good time when they're having a miserable time, and they're divided and don't know it. I have to start to study my internal state every second, even as I'm sitting here now, and seeing what it's like, without trying to change it. Because if I try to change it and use, to simplify it, another negative escape tool, then I will think that the answer is in excitement or in more friends or in more money and I have not climbed that fence one inch. In fact, I've made it a little bit higher, at least in my mind. Freedom is a state where I make no division between you and myself. Which means I can know more now that I understand what it means to have a conscience, to be, would you like a, a nice, simple word, to be a decent human being. I can no more injure you than I can injure myself, because self injury has begun to come to an end through an insight of my actual state. Remember what was said a while back, no human being ever consciously, <clears throat> knowingly injures himself. We injure ourselves because, to quote, we know not what we do, but we suffer from it at the same time, and we know we do, at not only at the time, you see, you see, when I do something wrong, whether it's just a thought, it may not connect with you at all, but if I have a, a negative thought, I am punished on the spot, there's no time gap in punishment, self-punishment, you see, right now, if I am quite angry right now, I am burning right now okay. so it is instantaneous also if I am sitting here or standing here in a state of consciousness or awareness which is freedom I am also I don't like to use this word but I can't think of another I am blessed on the spot I am made healthy on the spot because I am both my own right medicine and my own wrong medicine. Now that I have a conscience, this is not my individual item, only, only vanity and egotism and negativity is individual. But once I have a conscience, it is everything. It's like the sun, it shines on anyone, which is not, I'm not being flowery about this. I say this because it is a fact. Then when I meet a situation out in the world in the state of conscience, because I've, I've seen the state, I've seen the prison, and I want out, and I've got out through study, get out of the thing altogether. And I'm out in the world 
and I see other people who are in the state that I used to be in, the minute I see them and I see how cruel, how vicious, yes, they are, it is impossible for me to have any self-damaging self-righteousness toward them. When I see myself in all my horror, and I see you in the same state, I never condemn. Condemnation of another human being, uh, forget Christ condemning the Pharisees and things like that, that's on another level, which we could discuss if we want. Condemnation of a situation as well as a person, situation which displeases me, means that I still think that I am a petty God who has a right to dictate how that event out there should turn out. That I still think I possess a separate ego which can tell you how to behave toward me. Which means I do not as yet have a conscience, but maybe, maybe I'm working toward it. And then finally, the whole thing becomes clear to me, and I am in this state of awareness, of consciousness, which is not a state of thought which is divisive anymore, but a state which does, does not divide what on this level has this particular name, or your particular name, does not divide this name, this label, from your label. So I'm not anybody's enemy, and nobody on earth is my enemy. You tell people, again, that there's a way to live without having a single enemy, human or circumstance, and there's no difference. This thing is, is great, it covers everything. That you can get rid of all enemies in a flash, in a flash of realization. They would resist this truth because enemies are very important to people in prison. And we'll go into that briefly, then we're going to open it up. I only know who I am by comparing myself with you. If you you have to follow. If you don't exist as an opposite to me, I don't exist. Because, remember what we said again, there can't be a mountain without a valley. There can't be up without down. There can't be east without west. If I have labeled myself a good person, I'm living by an image of being good, which is not good at all, but very evil, very bad. And I have no conscience when I think I am going to buy thought. In order to keep this falsehood, this illusion in place, I must create a bad as an opposite. And you're very handy. See? So no matter how nice you are to me, no matter what you give to me, I'll have to find something wrong with you. Otherwise, I will not exist as a good person. When I see through this false identity that I have, I see that I've been imprisoned by a false idea, and I no longer have an image of being a good person, you cease to exist as an opposite to me, and therefore I don't need you to be an enemy anymore. And this is, again, is what true love is, where I don't need something in opposition in order to prove that I exist because I don't exist as a label. Do you, are you following? It takes a tremendous amount of courage daily, it won't come all at once, and of persistence and of leaping into the dark to give up the idea that you and I 
are separate from each other. On the physical level, yes, you have a different physical self than I have. You have a different name, which is a label. But this is not essence. This is what will pass away. This is what lives in time. The human body lives in time. God, truth, essence, does not live in time. Anything that lives not in time is conscience, because that is what God is. That is what now is, with a capital N. Just uh, a one or two sentence summary. Freedom comes, one, by seeing that I am not free. Freedom comes, two, by understanding that there is perhaps a way out, even though I don't see it as yet. But I'm so dissatisfied with the compound, with the prison yard, that I'm beginning to question. I'm beginning to question what my dear old dad told me and my dear old mother, who were nice enough people, but I, I know they were confused. I'm beginning to question them without feeling guilty about it. That's out. And then working persistently, just as we're doing right now, at this very minute, to get the facts on the escape route. And very, very, very definitely, there is a way out. Then, then when the facts are right, your knowledge is right, the feeling will follow. You will sense it, and you will know it. And you'll never go back. All right. Comments? Questions? What are these facts? Everything we've discussed so far on the level of knowledge, just just about everything. You 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 name anything we've discussed. This is a fact. The fact that there is a way out. It may not be a personal fact, but it is a fact, and it can become our personal fact through experience. The fact that we have to study study the the escape route which is, of course, internal, to see what the, what the false guards are. Would you like to know what one of the guards are? I just mentioned it, but I'll repeat it. A sense of shame and of guilt. Don't you dare. Don't you dare give in to a sense of shame or guilt. I don't care what you have done. There are absolutely no exceptions. Don't you dare ever feel ashamed of anything you've ever done. Because that is condemnation. And who is doing the condemning? The little evil imp that just loves to make you miserable. Don't you believe it. Don't accept it. Another guard. Another one? Yeah. False sense of morality. False goodness. Contrived goodness. Oh, it is terrible to be mechanically good. It is absolutely horrible. We covered it a little bit in another talk. What a you want you want to you want to take a deep breath of relief. You work on this, all these things we talked about, until the point comes when <laughs> we're going to laugh the other night. I don't know. Maybe we'll get another laugh. You work on this till the point where your dear old friend Sally Lou phones you from next door, and as she has been doing for the last six months and year. And <laughs> may, may I put it this way, not speaking personally, <laughs> and you're so gullible, you'll do anything people tell you. She tells you to come over and drive her kids to school, and it's very remarkable how often her, she has a crisis where you have to drive her kids to school, and, you, and you, the preacher just said, we should love one another and help one another. And you resent it, but you go ahead and do it. You get your own example. I, I know they're there, and you know they're there. You, you start working against this, and you, you see, the reason you don't do it is because you're afraid of Sally Lou. You're afraid she's, for the first, you're not going to, you're going to watch, be afraid of the expression on your, her face the first time you do this. You do it. Don't be gullible, for heaven's sake. Then when it's all over, all over, you will see that you are doing actually the kindest thing. Sally Lou is not going to come down here and study these, I, I guarantee you. But you have seen, may I, may I use even a stronger word here? You have stopped being a sucker. And it's about time. Getting lost when we
we don't label things good or bad on, on the current level that we're on? No, because there's something obviously stupid foolish things but start to question them and you'll begin to see the, the difference between the two I, I, I will tell you again you know, I know this sounds very negative at times to talk about anger and all that but you will you will literally and physically someday sitting in your home having rid of yourself of the burden of 10,000 Sally Lou's around your back <coughs> because you're no longer living from a mere image of being good and therefore creating unconscious resentment in yourself. You have gone against another guard called false sense of guilt. If I think, all right, Paul, if I think, I'm talking to you, you have to put If I think that I owe you something, which is all, all wrong. The only thing I owe you is to be a free human being, but I owe that first to myself. The only thing you owe to anyone else is for you to be right. If I'm living mixed up and confused to the degree that I think that I owe you something quite unconscious to myself, and I'll hide it and I'll never admit it, but it's there. To the same degree, I'll think you owe me something. And I'll all be, always be asking, when's the payoff? People in orthodox, can I use that word, religion, who have been brought up in the, the, these false ideas about God, are very often severely neurotic people for the one reason they, they go to church and they go home and they sing their hymns for 20, 30, 40 years, and all the time in their mind they're asking, when is God going to pay me off for being such a good Christian? And it's never going to come because the whole thing is false. And these people who sing that they love Christ and God are very bitter against God. Not really against God because they don't know who God is. They've got a label. And God is usually someone who, who's going to uh, reward them in heaven or something like that. Yes. I think talk about the truth self and the false self. happened to everyone in this room without exception you know that 
You lived in that home when you were children. You went out to Sunday school. You went to church. You went to meetings. You went to parties. And you saw how bad it really was. But you, did, you didn't know what to do. And so we accepted false values, which built the false self. And we took this. We take this as being absolutely necessary. And so we begin to imitate our parents. My father used to, when I was a boy, he used to take me on the streetcar way down Los Angeles way, and all the way down, even as a kid, I could sense it. He would tell me, Vernon, when we get the, this oil, he was oil land, when the oil comes up, we're all going to be rich and all that. Put it into my mind. This is the value. You get rich. This is what life is all about. We are, we are here right now to rebel violently but wisely. Then, when the false is gone, the true is. You don't have to do a thing. How do you recognize the true? Uh, I mean, you say you got this mm -hmm. inner self or anything. How, how does it uh, come out? Mm -hmm. How does it react? Mm -hmm. One, there is no way on earth I can explain it to you. Two, you will know and then when I come to Denver again, we'll shake hands and we'll say a word. To each other, we won't have to. There are clues all along the way. When a man, when a man, for example, comes to me and he starts talking about, about such things as he realizes what an idiot he was 10 years ago, this is good, see. This means he's already stopped lying about himself, see. Or contrary, the person comes and he talks endlessly about all the money he's making. This means that this, this is his world, nothing there for him. And so you just quietly listen and say nothing. You can tell, you can tell in yourself, you, you know, it's, a, it's a, an amazing thing to watch yourself change in your life. When this changes, the outward changes. Why is it so painful? Pardon? It is quite painful. Yes, it's painful. Why is it? Oh, it's painful because you're afraid of death. All right, very briefly. We have about two minutes. This connects me. I become correspondingly alive to true life. If I die to the I, if I die to the idea that I have to fight out in the business world, don't you dare believe it. Don't you go to businessmen's meeting and believe anything they tell you. They're all wrong. And they're miserable too. Watch them when they're not on the platform. Watch their face look through. You die to the idea that you have to fight out in this world because you don't have to fight. We fight because we think that the sense of self depends upon it. Mm -hmm. And we get a great thrill out of fighting. Remember we've covered this many times before. There's a false feeling of life in fighting events and in fighting people. If I give up the idea that I have to fight, you'll find that out on that level, your business affairs will go just as they would have gone before, because you are not controlling them at all. And, and that's another thing you have to give up. The idea that you are a separate self, a separate God, who can control. You do not control. Now I'll tell you how to control everything. Really. This is not a contradiction. We're talking on the level of words which have opposites. I will tell you how to control your life 100% totally without exception. You control life by being one with it, which means first you are one with yourself and that makes you automatically one with this gentleman and with this lady and with that circumstance and with that circumstance out there. And it also makes you one with physical death. 
then the whole question of death itself and what happens after death vanishes because you no longer answer the, ask the question because you see that the question was false which we won't go into just now to control everything be willing to control absolutely nothing and then you will control everything because there is no opposition when there's no opposition you are in control pardon of course we do we build up comp uh, opposition because we're living from many false ideas one of them being the frantic the frantic belief that I must hold you as my wife that I must get that raise that I must make the sale it's painful because we're afraid of letting go of what we have called myself if we let go one step at a time we will begin to live one step at a time and then after many many weeks and many months and many years we have no enemies and we'll have no fears you can only have fear if you have something that is opposed to you when you see that there is no enemy but with the exception if i may put it this way there's no enemy except the illusion that there is an enemy this is not metaphysics it is just a fact i think we better quit for now and then come back later now keep in mind everything we have covered up to now and pour it all in to what we're going to take up for this in part this part of the program which is covering the question which most people ask perhaps 50 or 100 times a day which is very simply this but what do I do all day long people are asking themselves this to themselves in connection with their home life their inner problems what to do with a wife or with a husband with a child what to do with their life in general in, in fact this is a, a constant nagging question with most human beings now I wonder if for even maybe even for a split second here tonight you will accept the fact that in this state of freedom of authentic genuine conscience and right relationship that we've been talking about that in this state there is no need whatsoever for psychological decisions decisions you will never have to have to ask what shall i do about this problem with my relative my distant relative or with my neighbor or with my boss or with this circumstance which is getting me down now to clarify everything we're going to separate our levels for a minute on the level of physical life i have to make perhaps hundreds of decisions a day which are no problem at all example if i want a green salad instead of a red salad if there is such a thing for dinner that is not a psychological problem to me no particular problem vacation or whatever no problem because these things are on the level of everyday convenience and I simply make a choice and if correction needs to be made I can make that correction nothing here to bother us I am in trouble only when I do not know how to handle 
either myself or you or the neighbor. And what a great relief and what a great freedom it would be if I did not have to ask myself this question every day. I will tell you that it is completely unnecessary to live in psychological choice or decision. Have you ever noticed that when you make a decision, you have to make another one maybe five minutes later, or you have to correct that decision, or you have to start worrying about it? You come to the fork in the road, and there's the left fork, and there's the right fork, and you start down the right fork, and about ten yards later you say, maybe I'd be better off going down, have gone down the left fork. And so you go down the right one, worried, what you've missed, see? Then you come to another one, and you start the whole process over. Human beings are so afraid they're going to miss something. The whole idea of being cheated, of missing out, will vanish when you understand what we mean by living in a state of not needing to have a choice. I'll, I'll state it in, in different ways, and you'll see, you'll make the connection. Truth, capital T, reality, capital R, God, never has to make a choice about anything at all. Because choices are made only when the mind is divided against itself. The mind can be divided against itself in choosing the green salad instead of the red one, but that does not tear you apart. You make your choice and that's the end of it. We oppose ourselves by thinking that taking this fork, the left, by taking the left fork, I will assure the permanence, the stability, the security of, see, we always come back to this. By taking the left fork, I will assure the permanence, the stability, the happiness of what I call Tom Smith, Mary Jones. But even when going down the left fork, making the choice of whether to quit living in Denver and moving to Chicago or to quit being a salesman and to become a TV mechanic. I'm living from a self which thinks it can do something for itself. If there is an imaginary horse standing here, I can go out and spend my money, thousands of dollars, buying oats for it, buying saddles for it, and worrying over it. But if the horse doesn't exist, I'm wasting my time and my strength and my money and, and my, my whole life. When I, it finally dawns on me, I am trying to sustain, to make secure, to make happy an imaginary picture of, I have of myself, I stop making choices, painful choices, of left or right or up or down, because I see the whole thing was based on the illusion that I can do something for myself. Because, now you, you get this, you get this, and you go out of here off the mat. Because you see that you do not exist as a labeled self, therefore there is absolutely nothing to do for it. You cannot do a thing for God, believe me. You cannot help Him. Therefore, you cannot help your essence. Put a capital E on it if that makes it any better. You can't add one ounce to the kingdom of heaven within. It is already complete. When you are living from the complete kingdom of heaven within, because you have first died to all false labels about who you are, and you're not feeding this imaginary entity called Tom Jones, the label is all right, otherwise I'd have to identify you by your yellow sweater, which is again a label, 
but I don't think the label is me. When this happens, where on earth do I ever have to make a painful choice about anything at all? This is not a state of being, the lady mentioned this morning in a, in a right way, this is not a state of being asleep, of having nothing to do. This is, this is a state of tremendous attention, of tremendous life, of not blundering down that path and then being worried about it. Here's what we're doing. We're, we've gone down this left fork or right fork, and it doesn't make a, a hood of difference which one you take. Not any difference at all. Because you're going to have to use, I'm using a figure of speech now, you're going to have to come back the same road that you went down in order to get back to the main single divide, undivided highway. See, the highway is, is one thing, but here's the detour of choice. Here's the detour, detour of opposite choice. <coughs> Two people can be in the same circumstance and make opposite choices and both be miserable. See? Think about the single idea that where you are single, what do you have to choose? I don't know what you'd have to choose. Because there's nothing to choose. This means that I am now going to have, I am now going to have to suffer consciously from what I used to suffer from unconsciously I used to be very afraid of my boss of my husband that gay man at the party who was really very cruel my wife was equally cruel because she and he doesn't know what he and she is doing to themselves by cruelty, and so you don't condemn what you understand. When I see that I must give up the false self, there's nothing to do for it because there's nothing there anymore. Then when I come to what I used to think was a choice, not on the everyday level, but on a psychological level, I don't even think about choice anymore because I'm not on the level of divided thought. I'm on the level of awareness of consciousness where I don't exist anymore as a separate label self. I still exist. I'm standing here. You're sitting there. But you can sit there in a state where there's nothing to do but be highly alert, completely alert to what is going on without taking a side. When any human being takes a see, I'm afraid you, you, you won't see this because it, it, it's, it's throwing a lot. When any human being takes any side whatsoever on the spiritual psychological level he is in a state of conflict and therefore in a state of fear <clears throat> if I choose the left fork I'm afraid that I might have missed something out on the other one so I have to start giving up the idea that there is any advantage whatsoever in either psychological choice because there is none so if you find yourself, I'll, I'll tell you how to work practical, in a practical way on this. See, you, you, we have to work where we are, exactly where we are. If we're on the second floor of understanding, we work there. No, no, no other place to work. I'm not on the third floor, you're on the second floor. I make a choice sometime. You find your own, you have to find your own example. You've made that choice. Now, when you're in this, this left fork, while you're in it, simply be conscious that there is nothing going on of benefit to you because there's no one to be benefited. And with that, the fear of the opposite vanishes too, which again connects with the fact that there are no enemies in a state of oneness, and therefore no fear of a future enemy, either 
uh, a bad health, for example, or a death, for example, because there's no opposite. Choice is on the level on the choice is on the level of the mind, which always creates opposite. We're using our mind on the level. Do you remember this morning? Only for practical thought. And this is a state of freedom when we choose only on this level of the green salad or red salad, but not try to do a single thing for a sense of self because it does not exist in the first place. Then comes a tremendous relief, and boy, will your life change. I'd like to um, open it up now. <laughs> I don't exactly understand. Can I get you on a practical level of, yeah. say, a man who would choose between being a TV salesman and an uh, auto mechanic? Okay. Now, you say if he chooses one, uh, then it, it splits, you know, he might get something in the other job. And what does he do? Does he just sit there? I'm, I'm sorry, I don't get your point. If he chooses one, he goes to work. Yes, he's made a choice. Of course not. He is one with what he's doing, and he's not envious, and he's not concerned with the opposite. Well, it can be based on many, many factors, which gets into a, another thing entirely, and if you like, we'll go into it very briefly. This, I didn't want to say this, but I'm going to say it anyway. This may be the last time I'll ever give a talk here. <laughs> last time. <laughs> I told, I warned you, or I gave you a hint earlier. Don't you believe what they tell you at these salesman meetings where the guy gets up and gives the dynamic talk to pounds and pulp, but don't believe a word they say. You cannot, you, you're not, half of you are not going to believe me, but here goes, and this is the end of me. <laughs> you cannot have an aim on the everyday level. You cannot say, I am going to be a doctor or a TV mechanic and follow out that aim because you do not exist as a human being who has control over events. You are not a separate self apart from events. You are one with every single event, which are billions of billions of them on, on Earth. I swear this is the end. When you... When you achieve a goal you have set for yourself, it is purely and absolutely accidental, based on 10,000 accidental factors coming together, including your own desire. And this desire was conditioned by society, so it wasn't you to begin with. You cannot have an aim on the everyday level. And when you see this, among other things, you can be a complete flop in life, financially, which is a man-made artificial set-up system, and not feel bad about it. Because you see that it was accidental, and not this great dynamic personality who started with a shoestring and built up his great business out of nothing. The guy next door did the very same thing, and he fought, and he's just as smart and just as energetic. What made the difference? All these accidental factors coming together. And this, again, is another thing that when you see is a great relief to you, and all envy of other human beings vanishes, and all attempts to pound your head against the wall in order to become rich and famous and popular ends. Because you see that you cannot do anything, but you can now, thank heaven, be someone. And you can be just what we were talking about, a free human being with a conscience who doesn't sell <coughs> guns 
to make money to kill human beings in other countries. I don't have to go into that, do I? If you, you're all Even if you make a million dollars, you can have the million dollars, and if you're not getting ego gratification from you, if you're not from it, if you're not attached to it, then it's just fine to have a million dollars. There's nothing wrong with that. It is the identification, the attachment that is wrong. To think that you did it, you did nothing of the sort. See this and see what a relief. See how it answers all your questions about how to behave out there in the world. If you hold your mind on something, aren't you more likely to attract all of these accidental things coming your way? Yes, there are certain laws which you need to say to know. If you make 20 dollars a day, by the law, certain laws of psychology and, and mechanics, you will make three sales a day. This is what business is based on, all these mechanical laws. But this has nothing to do, you see, with making you a happy human being. It may make you a rich human being, and then like people who've made a lot of money. It, 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 I'll tell you, it's good to be either a great success or a great failure, because either one can start to wake you up. Because when you get a lot of money or a lot of popularity, and you're real honest, you'll see that it's done nothing for you. Or if you're a complete failure, this can begin to wake you up too. Because in your bitterness, you begin to, begin to see that bitterness is false and wrong, and you don't want to be unhappy. The hardest people to reach are those who, who are asleep with just a nice moderate <clears throat> income and a nice little pretty wife and a nice handsome husband dragging down his 175 a week. Uh, back to these accidental factors, isn't there a law rather than an accident that brings the accidental factors to you? There yeah, is a law yeah, involved, right. and that's no accident. Well, it's accidental mechanicalness. We're using words, but it all means the same thing. As far as we're concerned, it's accidental because we don't control them, but the laws themselves are constant. It happens just just as the, the weather itself happens. You don't control the weather, neither do I. Yes? What role does self-discipline play? Pardon? What role does self-discipline discipline play? Self-discipline. Self-discipline, if you, if you change the word, if I may suggest, to self-responsibility, that's the whole business. Self-discipline can be dangerous if you take it wrongly because a neurotic human being is tremendously self-disciplined. He, he's hard and, and he's rigid. This is tremendous discipline. He's not gonna let you get through him. Self-responsibility is another thing. Self to be responsible means to let yourself be destroyed by every event that comes along. One ounce of you be destroyed. When you're completely destroyed, you're alive. Death must precede life. Do you have to be happy? Pardon? Do you have to be happy? Do you have to be happy? All right, let's think of happiness as a natural state, and then you ask me, do you have to be natural? See? Happiness is better than misery. This business of, of not being able to do in the exterior world is going to have to just jolt everything you do out there and do let it jolt it. Then you are one with every circumstance. I was running through my mind is that to be able to reach out to these things that we're talking about, it seems as though you'd be gloriously relaxed. You would give you up. People want to get rid of tension. There's all kind of books on getting rid of nervous tension. This is the way to get rid of nervous tension. Once and for all. This is the end of it, the whole business. Sure, this is, you, you want to simplify it that much? We're here to be happy human beings. It's all right, use the word, it's fine, but let's, let's be more specific about it so that we won't, we won't deceive ourselves about the nature of happiness.
if I may, I'll repeat it if I heard it correctly, and I'm sorry I missed a couple words. The lady was saying that uh, if we were occupied with working on our real self, our real nature, then the outer conditions can be whatever they wish to be, and we are unconcerned with them. Certainly because the real self, you remember we went into this many times, we even said that awareness, consciousness has no opposite. We're living from our original nature, our true self. Then events are, do not represent an opposite to what we want, to what we expect because we have no wants and expectations because we're free of their slavery. Then you understand that normal wants on the physical level, for example, or the want for rest, which is perfectly normal, or for recreation is perfectly normal. And then we'll see the difference between proper wants, correct wants, and false wants, which were built out from the fault, out of the false sense of self. Then there's no conflict. There can only be conflict between a false idea I have about myself and what happens out there. And if I will let what happens out there, starting right now, if I will let what happens, whether it has to do with another person or an event or circumstance, if I will let that teach me its lesson, the lesson being that I do not possess a separate self which is opposed to it, then the desire to have that man or that woman or that raise will die because I see that it does nothing for me because the I by which I have identified myself does not exist. Again, how can I feed an imaginary horse? I stop buying the oats and stop wasting my time and money on it. But in my illusion, I think he's standing there. But I finally see the illusion as an illusion when I do that, then my false actions stop right there. Then I'm not, in con I'm not competing with you to, to get oats to buy the horse. I'm not fighting with you anymore. Yeah. Well, when you achieve this, do you get the feeling that you don't even want to be part of this world sort of thing? I mean, you don't want to be caught up in the daily business and industry and right. be involved with other people, etc. All right. But it is not a sense of resistance to anything. See, a free human being can walk in and out of any situation whatsoever. And he can go down to that office and he can be in the world. He can be with that, that crabby boss or whatever the situation is. But because he is free, this doesn't touch him. He has nothing that corresponds with it. If I have no anger, as an example again, in me, if I have none at all, none, and not deceiving myself, so I, I really don't because I've seen, I've understood, I have no anger, then the anger of the boss cannot touch me because there has to be a correspondence in me for it to touch me. He can be angry, but it doesn't touch me. So you walk through the world as free as a bird, right in the very heart of it. Then you're in the state that the New Testament talks about, to be in the world, but not part of it. This is what this means. To be in the world, but not part of it. You're right in the center thing. You're going to continue with your work. I'm going to continue with what I do. Right in the heart of things. But you're not, you're not a part of the insanity. You're now a sane human being. And you're not contributing to it. You have ceased to contribute to it. It's not going to stop because they're not they're going to continue that way themselves. I told you before when you when we become sane I said we see that the opposite. When we become sane, your neighbor is not going to know about it because he is calling your sanity insanity and calling his insanity sanity. But you now know the difference. And part of our horror is to see how confused and mixed up we were. <laughs> you think the natives or people like that have a lesser problem this because they don't have all this materialism to fight? Uh, people who have found this that we're talking about? Oh, yeah. Uh, well, I'm just saying natives or, uh, uh, you know, the uneducated people, uh, are they closer to this than what we are? Than no, people? not necessarily. A poor person can be just as mentally sick as a rich person. It don't, I'll put it this people way. People in India, for example. Pardon? 
people in India or China or places like, like that where they don't have all this materialism. Uh, no, no, no. They have the same. You, what difference does it make whether a man has five cents in his pocket or a million dollars? What does that have to do with his state of mental health? You can, you can be very sick and be poor, or you can be very rich and be sane. It has no connection. Believe me, it has no connection. Look at a mob sometime, a raging, sick, neurotic mob. Look on television. And if you were to able to, you wouldn't be able to, to break down these people individually. You will see that they run the whole, whole the staircase of wealthy people, poor people, educated people, so-called educated people, with a head filled with facts. Mm -hmm. Uneducated people, the whole business. There's no difference. Mm -hmm. See, we, we're gloriously free of thinking about these things and putting all our attention on becoming sane and whole. Mm -hmm. Did someone raise this? Yes. <laughs> Would you repeat the last? Sentence? <laughs> 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 you must drive crazy. They, they, you don't react to them anymore. People, people, uh, you know, and they, they jump on your back. They want a reaction. Why don't you find out? <laughs> I'll, I'll go into extremes. I'm, I'm really taking an extreme to illustrate the point. When you start, when we start to get mentally healthy, to get out of the insane asylum we have called a garden party, the people who want to remain in there are going to be hostile to you. But now, now follow this, please. Don't make a blunder. Because you're beginning to threaten their sense of sanity. You're beginning to get out, and they were using you, they were exploiting you, because neurosis loves neurosis. <laughs> Sickness loves sickness. So when you start to get out of it, they're going to start to resent you because you are threatening their pseudo position of sanity. But you must not make the blunder, and most people do, of loving the excitement of saying, ha, ah, I'm beginning to be different. Already you've made a big mistake. It is right to not go along with it, but not fall into the trap of now becoming another little, little egotist who says, see, I'm so saintly, I don't associate with you anymore. Mm -hmm. See, you know, you take a lot of, of false religions and they call on your door all the time. And here's a tight little group all huddled together against a hostile world. These are very frightened people. And if one of these people ever threatens to, to leave, the lions pounce on them. Nothing, nothing is a greater sin than to, what's the word, apostate, oh, I don't know the word, but to fall away from the, quote, true faith, you become a devil. They, this is an extreme example. Try it for yourself, you see what happens, but you must never, see, I'll tell you, the more you learn, the more you grow, the more you keep your mouth shut about these things. Cast not your pearls against swine, lest they turn and rend you. Swine being people who are psychologically incapable of grasping these things who don't want them. And if you tell a truth to another person, maybe, in, see, when we start to get on with this, we do get enthusiastic, we get real excited, and this is right, this is real. And then we, we, we talk to someone, the wife or the husband or the friend, and we're shocked by their reaction, and we're, now we're worse off and we've forecast, we're already, we're so weak, we let them throw us off the track a little bit. And, and they will, you see, when a person doesn't know a truth and you tell it to them, they will always do one of two things, always, no exception. They will either scorn it or they will distort it. And you want nothing to do with that. You, you protect, which does not mean hiding. We're through with hiding. We're coming out in the open with this. We're exposing our, our inner thoughts, our inner self. You protect that seed, that little bit of light, from evil people who want to destroy it. I'm speaking strongly, and you know what I'm talking about. Keep your mouth shut and work in silence. Let thy works be done in secret. My Father who seeth in secret shall reward thee. Okay. 
you you may be the only one and, and I may I say this you may be the only one in your whole family who has the slightest interest in going into this this deeply most people don't they're not going to follow you don't look back and see who's following you you go all alone someday you will say thank heaven I did thank heaven thank heaven I didn't stop you mentioned years to do this uh it's naturally individual. Uh, it's an individualized thing, but is there an approximation at all in three, five, ten, <laughs> <laughs> three or five days? He says, <laughs> no years. Three or five <laughs> no, years. <laughs> Forget time, because already we <clears throat> talked about time. You think I know? You want to, how, how quick can I get rid of my pain? I know. You think about right now, this is the time zone you're working in. You think about right now the thoughts that are going through you and forget entirely because there's anxiety involved in the question itself. All right, I will say it. And this is, she's making notes back here. Would you start that next week? <laughs> See, this is an advanced secret. People are afraid that they won't have enough time to get this and save themselves before they die. <laughs> That's right. And I will, I will now relieve you by saying you can forget all about that. And you work right now, which is the only time zone there is. You can forget questions like that. Progress can come fast or it can come slow, depending upon how much personal effort you put into it. You work real hard. All right, you tell me. now. Somebody, please, please speak up. You tell me what it means to work. On yourself. Yes. Self-work is to watch what is happening inside, which is a, a good summary. Yes. Self-awareness. Self-awareness. Same thing. Right. Right. What is happening to me at this very minute, without identifying with it, without saying I do it, do it. Remember, we said, for example, it, it is all wrong to feel guilt and shame, no matter what thing we did that was actually wrong. You understand? Because this is identification. If I can see the guilt but refuse to identify with it. In order to identify myself at least a great sinner, then that is good work. I let it go. The nature of thoughts, remember, is to flow. And I must I can be, be aware of it without trying to stop it. If I try to stop it in order to get a feeling of I, I'm in a state of fixation. And this is what neurosis is. Neurosis, say you can use other terms if you want, is a state where thought has been clustered. And the man refuses to let go of that thought because he thinks, this is I, this is me. And help begins as we begin to let thoughts flow naturally as they're supposed to do. Just as a river, a dammed up river, it becomes clogged and the, the branches clog it up and all that. Take away the rocks and it flows again. Yeah. Oh, that's what I was going to say. I found the fastest progress I had made was when I began to become aware of losing things. Yes, yes. We're, we're getting the knowledge and the facts, and now we're putting it into individual practice, each one of us. Yes? Couldn't uh, the desire to be uh, one of the three ones or, or the progress may also be uh, to satisfy this false self or this ego? It could get distorted into that, yes. But this this would happen if we're careless, and then and then we become begin to have a picture, an image, of being a spiritual seeker, which the world is loaded with, mm -hmm. and they're the most dangerous kind. See, but if I can, if I can seek the truth, and, and I'm, I'm not, criti I'm not criticizing churches or anything like this, and I'm not, not pleasing, you know, this church either, mm -hmm. because this is good. Look, 
We're sitting here right now. It makes no difference what it says out there. We're sitting here, a group of people who want to know. And we can help each other from falling into this trap of having an image. All, all church authority, the Pope and all that stuff, is based on the authority of someone who knows more than we do. And he will exploit us because we're suckers, we're gullible. Where does God then fit into this program? God, well, we have to use words, you understand? All right, let's get a diff definition of God. The best definition of God, as far as I'm concerned, you can get your own, is the word whole, capital, with a capital, capital W-H-O-L-E, to me, to my mind. This represents God best of all. Because the whole includes you, includes this gentleman, includes the lady here, and it includes nature as well, it includes life, and it includes death, and there's no division between the two. God is not divided into parts. So if you want to think of God, you might want to think of the term whole, capital W-H-O-L-E. Then when all the parts work together, there's no conflict. If you and I are two healthy human beings, we can work together, we can have a social time together, and we don't have secret thoughts, we don't have secret envies, because we both know the same thing. We both have the same capital W-H-O-L-E between us. And I'm not competing with your ego, and you're not competing with mine. Do you believe in a personal, a knowable God? Pardon? Do you believe in a personal God, a knowable God? God cannot be found with the mind. When you say, God, please save me from myself, who on earth are you praying to? You, you ask yourself, you say, God, say, who are you praying to? You're praying to an idea you have about God. Therefore, this God is a part of your own mind and a projection of your mind. And this is why this church has an idea of God of being a certain kind of person, and the church next door has a different kind of a God. And God is neither one of these projections of the people who started these churches or who continue them. God is one thing, the whole, the whole business. Therefore, all right, you want to use the word prayer, fine, all right. I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what prayer is. Prayer is to simply be one with yourself. To be one with yourself is exactly the same as being one with God, if you want to use that term. God is not apart from you. A God that is apart from you is an idol, and nothing good can come of it except more delusion. I guess maybe one more and about wrap it up, yeah. Uh, you know, everyone's supposed to have a good self-image of themselves. What uh, would you uh, say would be a good self-image under this approach? There are no good self-images at all. There's no such thing as a good self-image. We are out, contrary, I, I, I must say, to many books that would have been, which have been written, we are out to do the exact opposite of building self-images. We are out to destroy them completely. And when you have done that, you'll be very glad that you did. Images are traps, because I now have to build, live up to it. Well, aren't uh, we all, on a certain level, where a good self-image is necessary? So we, uh, unfold? No, no. Do not this idea? No, ma'am. Self-images are never necessary, but good ideas are necessary. See? Well, I mean, we're using the term image. I have an image of myself as being a certain kind of a person. And this is on the level of thought, and thought always has an opposite. I have an image of being, belief images divide human beings, and they don't not only divide you against me, but they divide you against you and me against me. May I suggest, so we, this doesn't sound negative, that we say we must have good positive thoughts. That is a good way to put it. And we have had nothing here tonight but good positive thoughts. This is the truth that sets us free. All right, you, th you think about self-images, and you think about the difference between them and simply having a good thought about self-growth within yourself, and you'll see a difference.
One more. Yes. One other thing that I would like to add to that. Yes. The greatest problem that I see with yourself is that the other person or persons doesn't have the same self-image of you as you do. Right. So consequently, there's always... Right. And when someone uh, catches this, she said, uh, you may have an image of yourself, but the other person doesn't have the self-same mm -hmm. image. Of course he doesn't. Mm -hmm. And when you don't reward my self-image, I am resentful of you. If I didn't have this image, I would not have any resentment at all toward you. I'd have no expectations at all toward you. Mm -hmm. This is why you can be, I'm, I'm using myself as a example, you understand? This is why when you're in a state of love, of conscience, you can behave toward me any way you want, and no matter how bad it may be for you, you may be angry, it can't hurt me because there's no one here to hurt. Mm -hmm. There's no image to get hurt. Anytime I get injured, hurt, disappointed, it's because I have an image, and this image creates an expectation, a demand of how a great, wonderful me should be treated. I write a new book, I'll, I'll get very personal, I write a new book, and it, it doesn't sell at all. I feel resentful. I put a demand out there in order to main my, maintain my image of being a great self-development author. If I had, did not have this image, and the book did not sell, and I don't write books, I'll go out and, and sell groceries and put bread on the table and be a free human being. I'm not going to be trapped. And don't you be trapped. See? It is now a quarter to ten. And we are free to go.